Hello everyone and welcome to Kotlin London. A really welcome, a really big welcome to all the recent new joiners from around the world. It's great to see how our audience is uh, growing up over, over the months. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, please join our Meetup page, hit the subscribe button, remember the bell, and follow us on Twitter. Also, if uh, you know someone or yourself uh, wants to uh, give a talk, please let us know, because uh, we're always looking for people. Uh, thanks to 47 Degrees for sponsoring uh, uh, Kotlin London. Please, <clears throat> please check, the, uh, check out the training courses in Kotlin and Factional Programming linked down in the, in the description. Um, also, if you want to get into streaming, we think StreamJar is great to help you uh, get started. There's a discount uh, referral link down in the description as well. If you sign up uh, for your subscription, we get a discount uh, in our subscription, which helps us uh, reduce the cost of this. Uh, today we have two really good talks, uh, really great talks. Uh, one from Nicola Corti from Spotify, and uh, another one from Nicola Frankel, to Nix, uh, from Hazelcast. Uh, a big thanks uh, to both of them for coming today and sharing the knowledge with us. Uh, as usual, uh, we'll hold a short Q&A for each talk, so please uh, post uh, your questions via the slider that we're going to share on the YouTube uh, uh, chat. Uh, uh, during the talks, please also share your encouragement, emojis, and short feedback in the chat. The speakers can see them, and it really helps to the engagement, to the engagement in, and the mood. So let's get started with our first talk. Nicola, whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm in the show. Amazing. So, hi everyone. Let me uh, start the slides. So, hi everyone. Thank you very much for being uh, um, live with us today. We're going to talk about there is one broken API among us. Uh, my name is Nicola Corti and a mandatory slide about myself. I am a Kotlin GDE. And I work as infrastructure engineer at Spotify in Stockholm, Sweden, and those are my contacts. You can find me on Twitter and on GitHub as Cortinico. Um, and also uh, check out my website and Corti.com. I also run a podcast, The Developer's Bakery, that you want, may, might want to check out if you're interested into like Kotlin and uh, developer tools and so on. And last important thing, I do have one JetBrains Ultimate license to give away. And I will give away that to one, the first question that comes on Slido. So make sure to make questions and add your name. Don't make questions as anonymous because we can't find you anymore. So leave your name over there. And the first one that drops a reasonable question, we'll get, we'll get the license for free. It's a one year Ultimate license. So let's get started. So you might ask yourself, uh, what is this talk about? And who is this talk for? Like, where are we going to hear about today? There is one broken API among us. So if you follow the Twitter handle of Kotlin, they tweeted like, hey, follow Kotlin London because they're going to talk about backend, Kotlin for backend. Well, today we are not really going to talk about Kotlin for backend. Uh, we are going to talk more about library developers and SDK developers. So if you have an open source library or a, or a closed source library, or if you develop an SDK, you will probably find information that are useful for you during this talk. If you are open source, even more, obviously, because uh, Again, open source, you probably have a lot of customers, a lot of users that are using your library. So uh, having a strong and clean API is even more crucial. But this talk is not only for, for open source geeks and nerds that uh, have a lot of libraries. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're, for example, a mobile developer or even a back, uh, backend developer, and you live in um, modularized world, you probably uh, need to have some sort of clean clean API for your code. For example, uh, in, a, in, Android, in an Android app, you might have a module that is structured in this way. For example, app feature and a profile, profile 
feature. And inside the profile feature, you might have two, two sub-modules, an API module and an implementation module. So the, the API will be uh, will contain all the public definitions that are exposed outside of your uh, profile module. And again, also in this context, although it's not open source, although it's not a library, it's just a module. In this context as well, having clean API and finding a good way to evolve them is crucial. So today I'm going to, to present some techniques and tools that will make you a good API citizen or a better API citizen. So I want to I want to walk through some of the some of the patterns or the tools that the Kotlin language offers to us developers that can make us a better API citizens. So the first one that I want to I want to recall to everyone is the deprecate annotation. So let's suppose that you have a function called replace uh, with a method with the use of type string. And this function is broken, or you don't want your users to use them anymore. Well, you could just remove it, but then people will come to your library and start complaining because you removed the method. Or you might be a better API citizen and annotate it with deprecated. If you do one step further, you also want to specify a message and a replace with. Specifically, the replace with allows the IDE to immediately understand and suggest how this uh, method call should be replaced. And uh, you can also specify the deprecation level, being that error or warning. That means that you want to uh, you want this if someone is using this this API that should be reported as an error to their build or just as a warning. As a side note here, you could also specify the precaution level dot hidden. This means that the method or the API will not be accessible from the source code, but will still keep API compatibility with the previous version. So you're sort of like making the method hidden. So another, another tool that is, that is crucial and is, it's really helpful to evolve your API is the opt-in annotation. So let's suppose that you have a new function called get answer that returns an integer, and uh, you you are not ready to release this API to to the public because this is experimental and you want to protect it in some way. The problem of releasing this publicly is that everyone will just start using it, and then it could be complicated after people start using it if you want to evolve further this API. That's why you can annotate your, uh, your experimental API with a custom annotation that you can create. In this case, I created this My Experimental API. And to, to use this mechanism, you create your annotation and you annotate the annotation with another annotation that is called requires opt-in. This is from Kotlin. And here you need to specify a message of which type of opt-in you're requiring here. For example, here you just call it uh, experimental API, but you could have different areas of your API. Like I, I can have um, experimental dates API and experimental async IO API and so on. So when people will start using your API, like in this case, they will just uh, try to print what this get answer function will, will return. They will be, they will receive an error and they will have to pick a choice. And they will have to decide if they want to propagate the surface of the experimental API. So they will be forced to uh, annotate also their function with my experimental API. This means that now the main function is also part of the experimental API. So whoever calls main will have to deal with this opt-in mechanism, or they can or they can use this other annotation that is the opt-in. This is the non-propagating um, approach. And it, it means that you, developer, know that you are using an experimental API. You're OK with that. This might break. But whoever will call main will not be warned in any way that they're using the experimental API. So a lot of, a lot of APIs inside Kotlin are actually using this mechanism. For example, coroutines started in this way and so on. Uh, but you can use it also for your libraries. If you have parts of, 
of your tool that you are still unsure if you want to release them publicly. And you want developers to explicitly opt in in your experimental features. So another, another tool that I really uh, invite you to take a look is the explicit API mode. This was added in Kotlin 1.4. And you can, you can enable that with a, with a compiler plugin. Or if you use Gradle, you can use um, the inside the Kotlin extension. You can use this uh, command, this function called explicit API warning, or just explicit API. Explicit API warning will enable explicit API in warning mode, while this, this command will enable explicit API in error mode. So what is this doing? This is forcing your code to be explicit. It means, for example, that if I have um, a class like this one, Chucker Interceptor, I don't specify the visibility here. So by default in Kotlin, this will be considered a public. But Explicit API mode forces me to, to declare all the visibility. So in this case, I need to intentionally write public there. As you can imagine, if you did a lot of Java to Kotlin, to Kotlin migration, you know that the default visibility in Java is different than the one in Kotlin. So um, a, a lot of times it happens that you just move the code around, you don't specify the visibility, you end up in the default, and you have side effects. You expose things to public and uh, by mistake, and then people start using them. With explicit API, you sort of protect yourself against those scenarios. So for example, if I have this function get answer 42, um, explicit API in this case will, will warn me that this is by default public and I need to annotate it with public. But explicit API will help me track also another um, potential breaking change. That is this, let's say that I go on this function and I added the return value from 42 to 42.0. So what is happening here is that I'm actually changing the return type of this function. Previously, it was int. It was inferred by the int literal. Well, in this case, now the function became a double and it's inferred from 42.0. This change is a breaking change. So by adding dot zero, I'm actually breaking one API. So the explicit API mode will warn me here and will suggest me to fix my API in this way. So here you see there is a public uh, specified here and also the return type is explicit. It could be inferred, but this is a public API. So it's better to be explicit and say that this is an integer. Uh, another tool is the semantic versioning. So here, there is no proper annotation for, for semantic versioning. It's more like, it's more like a, a technique. But I invite you to, to take a look at what semantic versioning really is and to be strict on semantic versioning for your releases of libraries, SDKs, and tools. Semantic versioning means that your, you mm, follow a versioning scheme that is composed by three parts, a major version, number that you bump whenever you release a new version that contains breaking changes. A minor version that you bump whenever you release new features in your software that are backward compatible with whatever was released before. And a patch version uh, that you bump whenever you release just bug fixes. So all those, uh, why I'm telling you this, this might be obvious for some, but I saw a lot of libraries out there that are just bumping the minor version and introducing breaking changes for, for consumer. So I really invite you to take a look at semant semantic versioning 2.0. Uh, if you Google that, you will find it. And it's translated in a lot of languages. And it gives you like uh, an overview of what semantic versioning really is. And my take on this is try to be as strict as possible. There are tools that help you automate semantic versioning and understand which number, which uh, component of your semantic version you need to bump. If you're strict with that, uh, people will understand what to expect from your, from your library, from your software. Try to don't blend emotions 
within your releases. If you're breaking an API, you need to do a major version. Like version numbers are free, so use them. I saw a lot of developers saying like, hey, no, I don't want to release 2.0 because there are no major features here, but you're actually breaking APIs. So yeah, release 2.0 because people will know that they might expect breaking changes. There is actually like a Bacchus now form grammar for how semantic versioning should be defined. And again, to reiterate what I said before, there are tools, there are automated tools that help you, that understand semantic versioning and can help you compose your version number. And now we're gonna see one. So I mentioned that the, all of those are techniques that will help you have a cleaner API and interact better with the ecosystem. Uh, but there are actually tools that can help you do this job and can um, warn you if you're about to do a mistake. Today, we're going to see two tools. Uh, the first one is called Binary Compatibility Validator. So this tool is a first party tool. So this is from JetBrains. You will find it on github.com uh, slash Kotlin slash binary compatibility validator. And uh, let's, let's take a look at what this tool is doing. So the setup, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty trivial. It, it comes bundled as a Gradle plugin. So I suppose the majority of you that are using Kotlin use Gradle to run it. So uh, they, like their brains did the same assumption. And uh, this is bundled as a Gradle plugin. I don't think you can unbundle it and run it standalone, but if you need a standalone solution, I have another tool for you later. So let's get back to this tool. How do you, how do you configure it? You add a class path dependency and you apply the plugin. Uh, and that's it. This plugin will add a couple of tasks for you. Uh, if you need some customization, you can actually use the API validation Lambda. And inside, you can specify some, some configuration. For example, you might have projects that you don't want to validate. If you have a library, you'll probably also have a sample project or examples or uh, tutorial projects that you are not interested in tracking the API of those. So you can, you can ignore them and we ignore projects. Uh, you might also have a package um, that is part of your internal API. So if you have a big SDK that has several artifacts, like for example, okay, HTTP as, as something like that, retrofit as something like that, bigger SDKs uh, need public visibility for their internal internal classes, but they still want to protect those classes. Uh, so they don't like, so what OKHTP is doing is saying like, hey, whatever lives inside the dot internal package, even if it's public, you should not use it. This is part of the internal API. So this tool allows you to exclude those classes with the ignore packages. So for example, this is a library I'm maintaining, it's called Chucker, and we do the same. We do have a package called com chucker team chucker internal. So whatever is that, I don't care. And then you might also have uh, an annotation to annotate this part of the API that you don't want to track. For example, you can have your own internal API annotation, annotation and all the APIs that are annotated with this will be ignored for the sake of validation. And then how, how this tool is working. So the first thing that you will do, you will call this task called API dump. What this task will do, will do a dump of your API and we create a .api file. So a .api file is, is basically like um, a representation of all of your API. And it like they use this sort of like weird syntax uh, if you played around a little bit with a bytecode, you prob it might look familiar to you. But for example, like here we have a public final class that is called Chucker and has uh, some fields inside. One is a static field and is an instance. And then we have a dismiss notification function that uh, expects an Android context and returns void, like, or unit in Kotlin. This V stands for void. 
Then we have a get launch intent that uh, expects a context and returns an Android intent. And then we have a function called is op that has no parameter, but returns a Boolean. So this Z is a Boolean. Uh, yeah, it might not look obvious to you, but this is the API representation. Uh, this is the represent representation of your public API. So why is this useful? This is useful because once you dump this file and you commit it and you have it in your repo, then you start your normal workflow. And your normal workflow is you run API check or you run just the check task. So the, the plugin configures uh, this extra task that runs as part of check. So if you run check on your CI, for example, you run all the tests or the static analysis, uh, tasks, also this one will be executed. So what this API check ta task is doing is recomputing the public API and is returning a success if the computed API is the same uh, as the API file that is on disk or will return a failure if the computed API has changed. So what you have to do if the API is changed, you need to call again API dump to regenerate the API file and commit it. This will mean that if you touch the public API, you also need to edit dot, these dot .api files. This means that when I open a pull request on an open source project that changes my public API, I will also see a change in the dot .api file. So it's really easy for me to track that, hey, I'm about to expose a new method, or, oi, a method is going away. Uh, let's see some example. This is an example of a non-breaking change. So I go on this class called Chucker Collector. Uh, there is a public class, and I add a new method called Clear. And this is a public method. So if I run API check, it will fail. It will tell me, hey, API changed then I will have to run API dump and include the changes to the API file. And here we see that the library.api file is actually changed and there is a new line. There is a new public final fun clear that has no parameter and returns void. And this is an example of a non-breaking change. I'm just adding a new method so people can start using it. I'm not breaking previous, previous user. Let's see an example of a breaking change instead. So I have a public class called Chucker Collector, and inside I have a property. So this property was mutable before. It's called show notification is Boolean, and it was a var. Now I'm changing it to be a val. So this is immutable now. This is a breaking change because if someone was trying like in their code they were doing uh, dot show notification equal false uh, it would not work anymore and here we can see inside the uh, dot api file like if i run if i run api check it will tell me a hey, api changed you need to rerun api dump and then here, this is actually really interesting because we have uh, the API representation of this class. And here we can see that we have the getter and the setter, like the, the Java API of this class, basically. So we, we have a uh, public final fun uh, get show notification. That is the getter. There is no parameter and it turns a Boolean. And then we have the setter uh, and the setter uh, expects a Boolean and it turns void. And we see that this line is gone. So we are actually removing one method. This is a breaking change. So again, if someone from Java was calling dot set show notification, now they will not compile anymore. And if someone from Kotlin was accessing this property, same, they will not be able to, to compile anymore. So to wrap up a little bit on this tool, what's the deal here? This tool helps you understand if your, uh, if your public API is changing. It doesn't really help you uh, to understand if you're doing a breaking change or not. My deal, my, my suggestion here is if you see red lines in the .api file, this is most likely going to be a breaking change because you're editing uh, things or you're removing stuff. 
If you see only green lines, you're just in increasing your API size. So that's probably not going to be a, a breaking change. So I want to show you in those last minutes another tool uh, that it's a bit more powerful than this, and it's called JAPI CMP. And this stands for Java API Compare. And it's a tool to compare Java APIs. Uh, again, it's open source, but this is not from JetBrains. This is uh, from, from the community. So you can just grab it and use it. And let's see, let's see how it works. So first, uh, you need to download it. And you can find it on Maven Central. So if you go and search on maven.org, uh, you can download this, this fat jar. Uh, that's probably the best, the best approach because uh, if you download this fat jar, you can just call java-jar, this jar with dependencies. If you download just the jar, then you will have to create a project and make sure that all the, all the dependencies are loaded properly. So uh, you will have to create like a Maven or a Gradle project. And it's, it's a bit annoying, especially if you, if you want to compare two artifacts. And so this is specifically what I personally do with JAPI CMP. I use it as, as a CLI. So as I said, I download this, this fat jar and I call java-jar JAPI CMP. And the first thing that I, that I do, like, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't use it every day. So uh, if you call it with dash H, it will actually show you a little bit of options that this, this tool has. And it, it has actually quite, quite a lot. And the most important one are the dash N. So with dash N, you specify the new version of your library. And with dash O, you specify the old version of your library. So this tool, what it's doing is running the diff of the API of two version of your artifacts. So if you're, if you're about to release version two and you have version one on the market, you can grab them and compare them and understand if there are breaking changes in between. And the cool thing about this tool is that it has a lot of uh, flags to fail in certain, certain scenarios. So you can say like fail if there are binary incompatibility, source incompatibility, uh, if there is a semantic version change that is unexpected and so on. And it's great if you want to integrate it within a, a CI system. So let me show you some examples of how I will invoke this, uh, this tool. So again, I will call it Java dash jar, the fat jar, and then I will say dash dash old and dash dash new. So here I'm about to release version 3.4 of a library and I get version 3.3 .3 and I compare them. So small note, if you are an Android engineer, you can't actually compare Android archives or AAR because they contain a lot of other stuff that this tool is not really able to understand, like resources, manifest, and so on. Uh, you need to get the classes.jar that is inside the Android archive. That's where the class files of your Java or Kotlin classes live. And that's the archive that can be uh, compared. Then what I usually do, I use this dash dash, dash HTML dash file because this creates an index.html that I can I can look at and it just creates a nice HTML representation of, of the result of this comparison. Um, when I use it for Chucker, I also use this dash dash include uh, only this, um, this package. So in our case, we have a package that is the com chucker team chucker.api. Uh, that is the package that we want to investigate. Uh, but if you don't have a package only, um, you can uh, do another another invocation with uh, those two those two flags. Ignore missing classes and no annotations. So I don't want to delve too much into details, but. So if you use an approach like this one, like you, you specify the packages they're interested in, uh, you will, uh, like this tool will analyze only those packages. 
Otherwise, the, t the tool will start analyzing the entire classes and the things that are inside those, those classes.jar. And especially if you're doing Android, the tool will start to complaining to complain about, hey, I don't know where Android.context is and, and a lot of other stuff. So uh, to wrap up, if you have a library, make sure you have like, a, you, you use packages properly and you have a package where you keep track of all of your public API. Uh, and you can still exclude other packages. For example, if you use view bindings uh, or data binding, you will have th those packages like dot data binding. And uh, you're not really interested in those unless you specifically expose like your view IDs that is not really common on Android. So with this dash dash exclude, you can control uh, which packages you want to look into and so on. So let's look at these HTML reports. So how it looks like. It looks like this is like plain old HTML, but then you have a nice report of all the classes that you have. And here you have an overview of which classes has been modified, which classes has been added. And so here is not super, super obvious, but if there is a, a bang or an asterisk, it means uh, that there are, um, binary incompatible changes or source incompatible changes. And here they are known. Uh, le let's look at another report. And here I'm doing a, a comparison between Chucker 3.2 and 3.4. And yeah, here there are several, like there are several banks, you see like on, on various classes. And let's look at some of those. For example, in the, in the Chucker classes, we removed one field. So the change is field removed. And the field was called log, log tag. And it was of type string. So we remove a string that was public and we used for logging. Well, this technically should be a major bump. But we felt like, OK, uh, people were not supposed to use this string. So uh, uh, it's not a major deal. Let's not do a major bump. But the reality is that we actually add another significant change. In, inside this class, Chucker Interceptor, we removed a constructor. So we have a change of type constructor removed. And this constructor, there was context, uh, collector, long, uh, blah, 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 is gone. This is a pretty strong change. And now you will say, oh, come on, this is like, uh, why, why is this guy telling us this? It's like <laughs> a super, super edge case, a niche uh, problem. I mean, yes and no, because people start to complain uh, at your desk and they will say that, hey, uh, there is uh, my, I'm doing stuff and this class fails with no such method uh, error and so on. And I saw those kind of problems, I don't want to say every day, but really frequently, like coin is as binary compatible changes in one of the recent release and so on. So you want to pay attention to your API in, in some form, especially if you want your library to grow. Uh, one last thing, uh, and then I want to wrap up because I think I'm a bit out uh, with time. And if I'm going too long, please someone stop me. Um, and is the JAPI CMP Gradle setup. So this tool is build agnostic. So it's, it's a Java library. You just need to run it. You can run it on your CI. You can run it locally and so on. It's not a Gradle plugin. So if you want to plug, plug this tool inside your Gradle, Maven, whatever library build system, you need to use external tools. For example, there is a JAPI CMP plugin, Gradle plugin, and uh, it works. Uh, it's, I'll be honest, it's not super easy to configure, but I will show you like how you can kick it off. And that's actually a configuration that Square and OKHTTP OK are using. So you need to create two new configurations. Uh, if you're not familiar with configurations, configurations are like those keywords like implementation, API, compile only, test implementation, and so on. And they represent a group of artifacts. So here we create two new. 
And one is called latest and one is called current. And so in your dependencies block, you will say that you add a new dependency basically and uh, for current and you add a dependency on your project library. And then with latest, you add another dependency on the latest released version of your library. You also need to make sure that uh, it's not like you don't want to do all the transitive resolution of this dependency. You're you're just interested in the in just library 3.4, not all the other like the Kotlin standard library and all the magic stuff that this this uh, dependency will will carry on. Then you can create a new a new task. For example, in this case is called JAPI CMP and is of type JAPI, JAPI CMP task. This is this is what the Gradle plugin is offering you, and this task basically uh, exposes all the um, all the flags that the, the CLI will will offer you. So in this case, what we do is we uh, we specify that the the old class path should be configuration the latest. So this one. And then we say that the new class path is configuration.current. So this one. And this task will basically run JPI CMP, grabbing the, the jar from the previous version, like from Maven Central or JCenter or whatever, and this project, like the project that you have locally. Then you can specify, for example, the HTML output file, if you should fail on modification, if you should ignore missing classes, and so on, if you have packages to include and to exclude, or so on. One last thing uh, in, the, in the crazy Gradle magic is that uh, these out of the box will not work for the same reason that I told you before, because this is an Android library, so it's an Android archive, but I'm interested in looking at the jar. So you need to make sure that you have a function like get jar classes or you use artifact view, but you need to find a way to get the jars. Uh, so you will do something like unzip the files and get in the classes.jar. And this will work. So this is how you can use JPI CMP within your Grail build if you want to run it at every step. I don't do this. I just wanted to show so you know that it's doable. Square is doing this. Uh, I will suggest if you have a Kotlin library, use the other tool. It's way easier to set up. And to wrap up, because I'm being super, super long. Sorry for this. So to, to wrap up, uh, I hope today I, I gave you the feeling, hopefully, that evolving the API is, is somehow complicated. It's, it's not easy. Uh, there is this document called Evolving Java Based APIs 2 from uh, Eclipse documentation, I believe. And they list all the possible scenarios of changes that you might do to your API. And they mention if this is a binary compatible change or a binary incompatible change. Or for some, they are like, oh, it may break compatibility. And there are tons of nodes or uh, edge cases and so on for interfaces, for methods. Uh, so it's not immediate. You need to be, you need to know how Java, Kotlin, and so on work. And there are tools that can help you. So today we saw two. The first one is binary compatibility validator, is a way to safeguard your API during your workflow. So you really integrate it easily especially if you have a Kotlin or a Gradle project. And this just like helps you every day if you're making mistakes. You can use JPI CMP instead if you want more fine grain, fine grain control over your API surface. And at the end of the day, this is useful when making a new release. Like what I do, I just run it before releasing a new version. So I have an overview of all the changes I did. And it's also helpful if you're making like a migration guide, or if you're making like release notes, it's helpful. You see like an overview of all the breaking changes you're about to ship. And at the end of the day, also don't forget and be a good API citizen. We saw some techniques today that might help you. 
so don't don't forget about those. That being said, sorry for being a bit longer. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you left a question because I have a uh, shiny JetBrains license to give away. Thank you for that. That was a really interesting talk. So let's see what questions we've had. Um, so someone anonymous uh, said, what's the impact of these tools on build times? Uh, that's an interesting question because I, I personally don't have statistics on those. I, so if you, if you run, um, if you run Gradle with parallel, with dash dash parallel, those tasks like these API checks and API dump, so on, they will run in parallel with the other, with the other tasks. So in my experience, um, these API validation always run in parallel with like, you know, running Juni tests on, or so on. They were really, really fast uh, in, in my experience. I never felt that there was a bottleneck, but it would be interesting to see. Cool. Uh, so I guess the next question is, uh, how is binary validation? Oh, where did it go? <laughs> so in, in, the, in, the, in the chat, it told me that Marcel Bro put the first question. So I would love to answer that and celebrate that he won the license. Okay. Uh, so who was the question? Yeah, Sorry. that one, the second, the second. Let's do the, the second. So the what's second the best? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and congrats, Marcel. So what's the best way to change the property type without introducing a breaking change? How would you go about changing var to val? Well, uh, it's it, you can't really go from var to val without introducing like without uh, not introducing a breaking change. So you have to introduce a breaking change. What you can do, you can have a function that, uh, like you can create functions that exposes uh, like this get show notification and set show notification. But if, if something was mutable before and now it's becoming immutable, that's necessarily a, a breaking change. You can still use deprecate. Like you can deprecate that property and uh, add, errors even inside the, have a custom getter, a custom setter, like, hey, you're not supposed to do this. Or you can have a custom getter or setter that is, that is printing a warning for the user, like, hey, you're accessing this field in the next version, this will not be possible anymore. Uh, but it really depends on case by case. Yeah, those annotations are really useful. So I guess the next question would be, uh, what I was saying earlier, how is binary validation uh, fit with Office code? Uh, yeah, so to like, I would say they are really independent because you run binary validation on your, uh, on your API that is not obfuscated. You obfuscate it afterwards. Also obfuscation is something you do when you ship like a bundle, like a, an Android app on the market. And at that point, you don't really care anymore about public API. So like it, it would be pointless to obfuscate an API that is public. Like why should I should I make other people's <laughs> like super complicated? Uh, so so yeah, uh, this makes sense if you if who consumes your code is another developer in a way that they need to interact with your methods and your functions, and yeah, yeah. I guess if it's open source, it should be alright. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. So the next one from Duncan. Uh, can the tools tell when I have broken binary comp compatibility, but not source compatibility? For example, replacing constructor with companion object invoke. Yeah, so the first tool, it does not. The second tool, yes. So binary compatibility validator is, it will just tell you, A, you're doing, uh, you're doing a breaking change. This will be reported. So we, you will have to change the API file. While uh, JPI CMP, you can specify if you want to fail for binary incompatible changes or for source incompatible changes. So uh, as I said before, JPI CMP offers more fine grain control over your API. So in your case, I will say, have a look at JPI CMP. Cool. And the next one from my namesake, Paolo uh, Guardiola. Uh, have you considered Metalaba? No, I haven't. I actually heard about it a couple of times, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got the time to play with that. 
Uh, I think it would be interesting to take a look. Uh, now that someone even raised the question, I think it's I should bump it on my backlog. I think I think we have a topic for our next talk. <laughs> Definitely. So the last uh, question from Shelby. Uh, what is the ideal description of test-friendly uh, library, especially regarding providing or not providing out-of-the-box text objects on public APIs? Yes. So uh, my ideal description of a test-friendly library is first make sure that you expose your core your core concepts as interfaces. Uh, then, it, like um, that, that makes creation of fakes implementation of your interfaces easier. If you want to be a really great API citizen, then you might also create a test util uh, module that contains fakes implementation of your of your interfaces already, so people can just use them. Uh, the, side, the, side, uh, the side effect or the drawback of this is that you will end up in situation where you have multiple, uh, multiple modules and you need to necessarily expose uh, public APIs between your modules. And so you will end up in situations like a catch DP. You will have to have those dot internal packages because there are two modules needs to communicate and they are like completely isolated. So things between them needs to be public, but there will be APIs that you want those two models to share, but you don't want others to see. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit more complicated to design like a test-friendly library, but as long as you use interfaces, uh, generally like testing should be should be easier. Cool. So that was the last question. Uh, any other remarks you want to mention? No, it was a pleasure. If you have questions, follow up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub or I don't know whatever. I'm more than happy to to follow up and answer uh, your questions. Thank cool. you. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, next, um, uh, next we have Ni uh, Nicola Frankel uh, talking about Kotlin in the back end. Uh, Nicola is the last time addition to today's event, and we really, really thank him to join us at, at last minute uh, and make make this possible, basically. And without more babbling uh, or ado, uh, here's Nicola. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. And thanks to be here with me for this talk about from imperative to reactive and then to coroutines, because, uh, well, that's not the hardest part, but it's important anyway. Uh, I'm Nicola Frankel. Um, I've, I've been a developer. I still hope that I'm a developer. Uh, but since uh, two years, I'm a developer advocate. Um, I'm far from a reactive guru. I just got interested because with the mouth to the cloud, uh, well, we are going to see that it might be a good idea. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Hazelcast uh, offers two products. First one is an in-memory data grid, and you can think about an in-memory data grid as distributed data structures. So you can uh, shard or replicate your data uh, over uh, nodes in the network. And the other is a local chat, and it does uh, in-memory stream process. I won't talk about any of them today. We'll just use a bit of caching afterwards. So I will use IMDG, but that's not the focus of the talk. Um, so if you have been doing a development since a couple of years, you probably know about the reactive manifesto. And it's quite already like nearly seven years. Um, and the reactive manifesto tells that uh, like a system in order to be uh, reactive like requires four, proper, uh, four properties. Yeah. Um, the first, it must be responsive. So you just don't need to wait a long time before you get your uh, response to your requests. The second, it's resilient. They're like failures are to be expected and your system shouldn't crash in such case should be elastic, meaning that, well, if the workload increases, it should still like do its job. And it's uh, based on messages and asynchronous. The fun part, the funny part about this manifesto, uh, like most of the people who are at the origin or like really liked it uh, are people 
from light bands. So the people like who are providing Scala and who are also providing the ACA framework. And you might have heard about the ACA framework and basically it's, it's based on the actor model from Erlang. And the idea is that you've got like actors and they don't share state between themselves. What they are doing is they are sending messages to each other and the messages is like <clears throat> in the queue and it gets like unpiled bit by bit. And it's pretty resilient, especially on the Erlang platform, because when an actor becomes unresponsive, then a new one uh, is spawned by the system or by another actor. But it didn't work out so well. I mean, Akka has like some market share, but it, it was not really that um, successful, I must say. What is pretty successful today, at least in my opinion, from my viewpoint, is reactive streams. And it, it, the reactive streams still handles all those properties, but uh, through a different component. So the idea behind reactive streams is you've got like, likewise, you've got an, like an, a, a pile of queues and well, I shouldn't say, uh, sorry, <laughs> a queue of events. And then <clears throat> you've got an event loop and the event loop like takes one message and sends it wherever. And meanwhile, you've got the event handler that's meant to manage the messages. There are very good reasons to use reactive and there are not so good reasons. Um, I believe that uh, the first reason is scalability might not be that good reason. The reason is, well, if you look at technical articles, they will tell you that, yeah, like, it doesn't scale. And my viewpoint on that is, in general, that's not very important. Most of our application, like most of the, uh, of the applications I worked with, like we're handling perhaps hundreds of concurrent users, perhaps thousands of concurrent users, but not that was once in my, in 20 years. And, and that's true that if you don't do reactive, if you do like normal threads, like normal GVM threads, they don't scale, but you probably don't need it. And the drawbacks is, well, I, I will get uh, back to it in the next slide. There is <clears throat> the real good reason, in my opinion, is, is to be more cloud friendly. Like if you are running your workloads on premise, what you, you are doing is you, you don't care that much about the correct usage of resources. You, you might be spending too many CPU cycles. You may be like using too much memory. That's not an issue because, well, the resource is there anyway. So waste is not that a problem. Now, if you move your workload to the cloud, you will be built per CPU usage. You will be built per memory usage. And in that case, it might have a huge impact on your, on your monthly bill. But it's a trade-off. So the trade-off, if you go reactive, it's not only unicorns and rainbows. Um, Actually, I found that uh, the reactive mountain model is, is much more complex. You are not just calling stuff, you are just subscribing and getting events that you can react to. And, and I mean, if you've got a non-trivial application, that starts being a bit hard as well. Everything is asynchronous. Of course, it's harder to debug uh, because when you don't have like one, thread to follow, but well, your, your program flow can switch threads. It's not really, really fun. Um, you've got specific APIs that you need to learn and they are very specific and very focused. And in general, what uh, happens when I don't know, like, hey, I would like to do that is uh, I, I, I call my reactive guru and I ask him, hey, I want to do that. And it gives me the real right method to call in that case. And finally, um, the idea is uh, you want your whole call chain to be reactive. So you want every, every component to subscribe to each other and not block. If at one point in the chain, you've got a blocking call, guess what? Then your chain is not reactive anymore. So 
it's good if you if you can like uh, win some money or not waste some money. On the other hand, um, depending on your developer level of experience, uh, where you come from, how you are organized, might be perhaps better to spend a bit more resource on hardware and less on like reactive programming. Um, so it, it's a trade-off. I mean, as an engineer, we are um, used to making trade-offs. It's not always like the best pass. So just like choose wisely. Um, the Reactive Streams API is actually very simple. It's based on just four blocks. Uh, the first is a publisher. The second is a subscriber. And the third is a subscription. And you can already see in the subscription, all our interfaces in the subscription interface that you've, you've got the back pressure in the request signature. So like with a subscription, you request like N items. And so that's how like a very, very slow subscribers like can handle like a very like fast moving publisher. It won't get overflowed. It will tell it, hey, just like give me like X N items. You're, it's enough for me at the moment. And because we will be uh, chaining our calls, we have a processor that can be a publisher and a subscriber. So it will be uh, the publisher uh, for uh, like the previous and the subscriber to the next. On top of that, of course, there are frameworks. And um, I will be talking about Spring Boot, so I will be describing a bit the Spring Boot way. And the Spring Boot way is to use Project Reactor. So it is just a, like an additional uh, abstraction layer and an implementation. So that, for example, on the Reactive Stream side, you have this publisher. And on the uh, like a reactor side, you've got flux and mono. Mono, you can emit zero or one item. Flux, you can emit as many items as you want, can be zero. This is an initiative that is led by Pivotal or Tensu, or I don't never know how they should be called now, VMware, I don't know. Um, and they have no dependency on Spring. So this is completely Spring agnostic. On the other hand, uh, it's the other way around, like Spring uses Project Reactor. And the fun part is if you, if you know about uh, the GDK, GDK itself has those uh, four building blocks, the four interfaces that we have seen in Reactive Streams. It's in the flow classes. So there are sub interface, like nested interface in the flow class. And on the, on the <coughs> sorry, on the side, it's a. Hey, there will be a migratory period while libraries move to adopt the new types in the GDK. However, this period is expected to be short. That this dates from like 2017, and like four years later, Project Reactor is still using like their own org reactive string package. So it's interesting. If you need to switch from uh, like org reactive streams to the flow class, there is in the reactive stream library, a flow adapters that lets you like move from one side to the other. Since Spring 5, Spring Framework 5, um, the V5 supports reactive types. And moreover, there is like a new like library before it was Spring MVC. Now there is something called Spring Web Flux, and this Spring Web Flux leverages uh, Project Reactor. So this gives us like two ways to do reactive with Spring. Well, uh, sorry, this gives <laughs> this gives us one way to do uh, reactive with Spring, Web Flux. But there are two ways to do it. Like either you can do it through annotations. So you can reuse the same annotations you were using before and just change the engine, or you can use the API. And also Spring MVC also allows you now to use functional APIs. So that's like looking at a project, it's very hard to distinguish between Spring MVC and Spring Web Flux. So in my demo, what I want to show you is how we can migrate our old Spring MVC, Spring Data GPA application into an application that is completely reactive from beginning to end. And well, I've talked enough, so uh, let's try to do it. 
And uh, at any point, if uh, you've got questions, I will be very happy if you ask them to me. Uh, Pablo, just like interrupt me and and ask the question because um, yeah, I can I can talk to my screen only uh, so long, and it's I, I like interaction. So here I, I've created a simple project. It's nothing mind blowing, and of course everything is in Kotlin. So uh, I, I'm trying to use the latest version from um, Spring Boot. I'm uh, using, I believe, the latest version from Kotlin, not uh, counting milestones, because I try never to use milestones. Um, and here I have the Spring Boot Starter Data GPA, Spring Boot Starter Web. I will be uh, using some caching, so I need Hazel cost and the Hibernate integration, which is very stupid because in that case I'm using an in-memory database, so I will be like caching in-memory that in-memory database. But I could use MySQL or whatever. It's just like to make my life simpler for the demo. And then, of course, I have the SteadyLib, Kotlin Reflect, and this is a traditional uh, project that was like created from. Uh, uh, um, spring uh, starter dot start dot spring dot io sorry so normal stuff now i have like a controller rest controller i have get mapping so i can like get one entity by id or all entities i've got my uh, spring data gpa repository it's good you just define the interface and you've got a lot of stuff for free and i've created like a person entity with like vols and because I have the Kotlin plugin, then it's it, it, there is a synthetic constructor at um, at compile time. So let's start it and let's see how it works. I already have uh, data created out of the box, um, so five entities. And I can now start to curl. So here I have um, I have enabled the Hibernate statistics because I want uh, to show you how you can interact with the cache as well. And after, at some point, you will see that I, I will lose the cache. So I will curl, and I will curl HTTP localhost 8080 person slash 1. Great. Uh, I just checked that I have a cache miss. Of course, the cache was completely empty. And uh, afterwards, it did a cache put. And because um, Hibernate allows me to do that, what I can do is I can load everything. And then Hibernate, through the second level cache and integration with Hazelcast, will put all entities. And now, if I do, like, I ask for an entity that I didn't load by ID before, it should be in the cache. So I have one cache hit. Perfect, that works. That's like standard application. I'm very happy about it. So what's the next step? As I mentioned, there are two ways now to migrate. I, should, I, I could just say, hey, I will keep the annotations and I will change the engine. Or I, 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 I could prefer, and that's what I will do, to like move to functional APIs for uh, APIs first, and I believe that's a bit better because you, if you have been doing Spring uh, MVC for a long time and, and you see the annotations, you might not notice the difference. At least if you change the way you code, you will say, "Hey, this is like clearly something different." So. I remove the annotations. Well, I create all the annotations, but now I, I don't have any controller anymore. I don't have get mappings. Now I have beans. And I, I'm using the route stuff. And here, you, it's the exact same application. Uh, it's just that I've just changed the way that my mapping are initialized by Spring. Now I'm using routes and beans instead of using um, controller, REST controllers, and REST mappings. And we just check that it still works because every time when there is a change, we need to check here, I still miss one put. Here, I will query the same, and there should be one hit. Yeah, works perfectly well. Not really mind blowing. It's just, hey, I mean, we are using the functional paradigm. Here, we create 
the OK response type, and we say to the body that it will be like the um, result of this like call. And here we do the same. Hmm. OK, great. Now we can see that it, it like we have this like route with this like body and uh, when you do like functional programming at least spring considers that um, it's perhaps better that if you put all the logic into a dedicated handler class so here what i'm doing is i create this handler class it depends on the repository and i can put the codes that i had before in this handler class and here i just have this method reference so just let's try it very quickly whoops and terminal yes it still works ah, i started it in a bug uh, so no it one miss one put do it again great magnificent awesome and so that we remove the controller annotation, we remove the get mapping, but we transform it and through we had now a configuration in bin. So it's not that interesting. And also we are using the plain Java API in Kotlin. So we need to uh, call the rot uh, function and then we need to build it, which is not great. Because with uh, Spring 5, Actually, there are like bits of Kotlin inside the framework. And for example, we have something called the route DSL. So what we can do when we use the route DSL, it, we, we can, oops, uh, we, we can have this kind of stuff. So we have this router, which uh, is from the router function DSL. And it looks a bit cleaner. You don't need to build everything. You can have one single build and have all your routes uh, inside of it. So let's check how it works. Again, I will check if there are any questions. Meanwhile, no question, no question, no problem. Ah, I hate when it happens like that. So I don't know which version I will be running. Let's see here. Still works. Yes, I knew it. I knew it. I just need to restart because um, if I start this process when another one is running, sometime I've got like strange results. Yeah, it still works. Put miss, perfect, another one, hit, perfect. Good. Now at this point in time, we have migrated our application to the functional way to like spring Web FM. So it's still Spring Web MVC, but the functional way. Nothing is reactive. But we are at a point where it will be like very, very easy to do that. And uh, let's see the changes we need to, to make at this point. They are really, really small. Of course, in the palm, we need to change the Spring Starter Web by Web Flux. And actually, the other thing that we need to do is to change the packages. But the names themselves, server request, server request, server response, server response, and router, router, they are, they are the same. So <laughs> this is like quite easy. Also, there is a bit of a change. And here, because we are like directly inserting the, the value and not like a reactive object, uh, we just need to call body value instead of body. Well, that's fine. And, and that's all. So just like, let's check it out and let's start it. Too fast. Let's start it while IntelliJ has finished its work. When the palm changes, I need to change 
the, the dependency as well, and it's not super fast. It still works. And it still works. Great, amazing. That's cool. But um, remember what I told you before. Now we have changed the like controller part to reactive, but DAX access components, they are still normal. We are just using Hibernate, GDBC, uh, and the plain GDBC driver. And those are blocking. So we have half of our application that is reactive and half that is blocking, which means our application is still blocking. We have achieved actually nothing. And that's where it really starts hurting because uh, we need to let go of GDBC, of uh, GPA, of Hibernate, of all the stuff that uh, we are used to. And we need to change like a lot more stuff. So let's see what we need to change. The first thing is no more Spring Boot Starter Data GPA. Now we, are, we use Spring Data R2DBC. So R2DBC is the reactive way with reactive drivers to access databases. Since we removed Hibernate as well, we remove the integration with Hazelcast. And then we don't use the simple uh, H2 database. We use the R2DBC version with the driver, with the reactive driver of H2. OK. How does it impact our code? Several places. Uh, the first thing is before we were using Hibernate and the schema was created for us. Now the schema is not created for us. So we create like a dedicated uh, SQL file to create the table. And we need to run it ourselves. So we create a command line runner that will be like uh, run by Spring at in its time. And we pass it the pass to the schema and we pass it uh, the pass to the insert to the, 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 the script that inserts the data. And we need to call them in turn. Like we must first A, create the schema and then create the, the, the data. Not great. Also, here we need to change our types. So uh, we need to like return a mono of server response and here as well. The good thing is that there is like uh, a Spring Data R2DBC that you tell it, hey, now this is a reactive sorting repository and it has the, the good written type. So if we can, if we check here, for example, we see that it returns a mono of person and here it returns a flux of person. So here we have the correct reactive types. Again, we don't do anything. It's just like out of the box. And this ID is not the uh, GPA uh, persistence API ID. It's like from Spring GPA, uh, from Spring Data. Let's see how it works now. Yes, it still works, but I have no cache. So um, actually, I, I cannot check that it's in the cache and that it got the cache version. There is no cache anymore. I just had to, to let go of the, cost of the cache. On the good side, however, now from beginning to end, I'm completely reactive. Now I can tell, hey, my application is reactive. Of course, I lost my quite many features, but my application is uh, finally reactive. But we can we can do better. I can tell you my application is reactive, but you are not well. You cannot just like trust me, and I don't trust myself either. Uh, so what we will be doing? We will be using a, a library called Blockhound, and Blockhound, uh, when it encounters uh, something that is blocking in a place where it shouldn't be blocking, that it will throw an exception. And here you can see that. Uh, I had to configure it because 
it found something. So Kotlin in some like at initialization time, there is a deep nested call to random access file red bytes, and this is blocking, and it's in a place where it shouldn't be blocking. So I, I just have to configure it to say, oh, that's okay. Otherwise, I cannot go further with uh, the demo, which uh, would be a bit sad. Uh, so if you are like serious about it, reactive, I would really, really, really encourage you to check these block hounds and to configure it. So you do it when you start the application. Before you do anything, you just uh, like install block hound and it will throw when it encounters a blocking call in like non supposed uh, in a place supposed to be non blocking. Yeah, still works. Amazing. Um, the next step is actually I will just like clean uh, my application a bit. Here I did it by hand, but a colleague of mine uh, pointed out to me that actually uh, Spring has a database populator. So you don't need to create the, the, the code by yourself. Uh, the A, just like do this, then and do that, then block. You just have this like composite database populator and you add your populator in orders and they will be run. Um, I just decided to add uh, one more like feature, which was not present initially. Um, what I, I want to do is um, I want to return a dedicated uh, um, entity when no entity is found in the code. I want to return a 404. Uh, you might argue that in that case, it shouldn't be a 404. OK, let's agree to disagree for the moment. Um, but instead of just returning nothing, I just want uh, to return like an HTTP status. So. Uh, here, what it's doing, and here you can see it starts being really like reactive API specific, is here I will do my regular call. And if here it's empty, then I will switch to another branch. And this branch will return mono.error of the not found exception. So here, if I do this, So it still works. And now let's say 14. Now I've got uh, like a nice error message with a regular status, which at least is something. So that's something that was not present in my initial application, but I, I want to, to be explicit about it. And that, that's easy to do. Just remember the switch if empty. The next step. I would like to get my cache back. So um, I will just add it manually. And in order to do that, I will be using between my like my routes, uh, my handler, sorry, and uh, my repository, I will be adding a service layer. Like we are using Spring so far, we didn't use any service. We need to have services all the time. Remember, we are using Spring. So what I will be doing is I create, I will start the application. Meanwhile, um, I, I will be creating this caching service, which um, takes a reference to an IMAP and to the repository. And it will uh, manually create a mono. So uh, what it does, hey, it does, hey, look in the cache. If the person is not in the cache, well, right, it's not in the cache. And then search in the repository. And on success, put it in the cache. Otherwise, just return the person that was found in the cache. And here on the like find all, what we do, we do like we did with Hibernate, like on every on next call, we will put like every entity in the cache. Let's see how it works. So the log tells us, hey, person with ID1 not found in the cache, and person with ID1 put in the cache. And if we check it again, yes, ID1 was found in the cache. Amazing. Now, if we like read everything and we ask for another entity, 
they have the exact same behavior that we had with Hibernate before. So it's it's like we got our cash back finally. But here I, I don't like this. Like this doesn't feel very reactive, very functional API. So the next step is to use the real API, not do it by hand. And in that case, what we do is here, uh, Hazelcast provides you with an async API. But of course, since our API is a bit old already, uh, when you call get async, you get a completable future, a completion stage, not a completable future. So what we are we need to do is to bridge between the completion stage and the mono. Great, mono has it for us. So mono from completion stage. So now we've got a mono. And if we find something, so do on next, there is something. Hey, we will log with a logger that comes from the reactor util. So you can like uh, hope that uh, it's not blocking, which is really, really good. We will write, hey, this is found in the cache. And if nothing is found, then we will try to find in the repository. And again, if it's found in the repository, we will put it like asynchronously in the cache and we will log. And here we just change uh, the put to put async. And I forgot to stop and to restart. So I need time to start. So here I will do the same. Yes, it works. And person with ID1 set in cache. Person with ID1 found in cache. Amazing. Now I can put everything. And if I call ID2, it will find me with ID2. And again, I guarantee that everything is, is asynchronous because I have block hounds. Final step. Um, so far, there weren't that many Kotlin specific stuff. There is uh, the root of DSL, and that's all. But now we are using like Project Reactor. So if you are a Java developer, like you can do that uh, that way uh, with Kotlin. But it would be really, really great to uh, use coroutines because I mean it's it's the real like use case for coroutines now. For that, we just uh, need to of course add the coroutines uh, package. Uh, why do I have to? Yes, one is uh, yeah, end. This one is a bridge between Project Reactor and Coroutines. And the rest is quite easy. We need to change the signatures of our uh, like method, uh, function, sorry, that return monos or flux or whatever. And we will just like use the plain types. So for that, the first thing that we need to change is now we have a coroutine sorting repository, which return the real good type. So now if we check, um, sorry, so it must be in the service, we can uh, check that this correctly should return like a T. And here we can see that it should return a flow. So now we, we have just like removed uh, the mono and flux, we are using the standard type of the flow when in the case of a collection. Uh, meanwhile, sorry. Meanwhile, here we need to annotate our uh, functions with suspend and like return the correct type. And at compile time, the coroutine plugin will write the deferred of server response in both cases. And we just need to change here with body and weight, like both flow and person. Also, there is a change, but again, it's it's there for us. We didn't need to write anything. Here, we don't have a router, we have a co-router. So a router that is compatible with coroutines. And normally at this point, I have like migrated my application to reactive and I am like leveraging the Kotlin features namely the DSL and the coroutines. So let's check. 
it works. And here I should have not found, put found, and I can ask for everything. And sorry, too fast. And I can ask for ID2, and it will be in the cache. Amazing. That works. And here you can be sure that uh, I'm not like fooling you. It's executed in different threads. Now let's get back to our slides. Um, so I hope that in this talk I uh, showed you uh, how to migrate from like imperative to reactive. Uh, my advice is first migrate to functional APIs. Uh, if you you can still use annotations, but I think that you need to be more experts if you want to use annotations. Uh, with reactive than just using the functional API because functional API will make you, your mind really think, hey, I'm using something different. If you migrate to reactive, remember that all the calls in the chain needs to be reactive. Um, if not, well, you are blocking. Uh, so you will probably be less blocking, but it will be blocking anyway. So you won't be liberating the full power of reactive. Um, so just use block count just to like verify at runtime that you are you didn't forget anything. Uh, I believe it's more work, um, but it's not impossible. And if you are using caroutines, in my in my like humble opinion, uh, it allows you to use reactive in a more natural way, so that it's less a stress on your on your point of view. And more importantly. Uh, don't use reactives because you see me talking about it or you see other cool uh, people, not to say I am cool, but other cool people uh, that uh, tell you that you should use reactive. It's true for everything, for microservices, for Kafka, for everything. Uh, just use it because you have the use case for it. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, you can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. More importantly, you can get uh, the repo, so the code that I've shown you uh, is available on GitHub. It's public. You can check it. You can run it. Uh, you can fork it. You can PR it, whatever you want. Um, and if at any time you want uh, to talk uh, about Hazelcars, join our Slack. If you want uh, to be uh, the next uh, Hazelcars developer, then you, we also offer free training. And that's all. And now perhaps there are some questions. So let's see. Yeah, I think we have one question from YouTube, uh, which is uh, from Oliver. Thus, oh, there you go. Does the show, uh, does the show uh, blockhound setup still work with coroutines? Yes, it does. And actually, as uh, I have uh, shown, it's still there. Up. It's still there. I, I didn't change that. So uh, here. You, you can, if you don't trust me again, just get the code and run it at home and you will see. And you will also see that if I remove uh, this uh, with, so with, if I remove the exception, I will have a runtime exception. Sorry, if I remove this block, I will have a, a runtime exception that tells me, hey, you did something very bad uh, because uh, there is something blocking in your app. Cool. I think I, I have one actually. Um, what's uh, what's the most positive and maybe most negative thing of uh, going from uh, Rx to coroutines? Like you can uh, say. To be honest, I don't know Rx. Uh, very very frankly, I don't know Rx, so I, I can. Sorry, uh, flow. I meant flow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean from, from using Project Reactor to, from use uh, to coroutines? Well. Uh, Honestly, as I mentioned, I try to make my work easier. So I believe if it's possible, if you are using Kotlin, you should use coroutine as much as possible if you want to be reactive. Um, that allows you uh, not to know the exact reactive API by heart. For me, that's the hardest part. I mean, uh, like the reactive uh, uh, API is very, very large, very wide, very detailed. It, you have a case for everything. And yeah, my, I mean, you need to know a lot of things by heart. You know to browse the docs you, or you need to have a guru at hand. 
and uh, my, my mind doesn't work like that. So I, I prefer to have the the most natural way, the way I've been taught computer programming, and and and, do, uh, and let the coroutines handles the the, the, the nitty gritty details for me when I can. Yeah, it definitely feels a bit more natural, and you don't have to go to Google so often. <laughs> Cool. If anything else you want to mention, I don't think we double check. I don't think there's any more questions. No more questions. Uh, if you come up with questions later, just like ping me on Twitter, ping me on the Kotlin Slack, uh, anywhere, and I will be uh, happy to try to answer that, your questions. So thanks a lot for your uh, time, and I hope to see you sometime, somewhere in person, and take care. Yeah, thanks for joining us and uh, saving saving the show, basically. <laughs> cool. Uh, so that's it for today. Um, I, um, we'll be back on the 14th of April. Uh, and thanks again to both the Nicks <laughs> that we've had today and all the time. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, and I hope you, you enjoyed the, the, the talks. Remember that you can rewatch the talks uh, on YouTube um, if you want to have a look. And thanks also to the rest of the team, Guillermo, behind the scenes, uh, Amar, Enzo, and, and I. Uh, stay safe uh, indoors or wherever you are. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>